in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Allow me to say a few words about what we just heard and uh, uh, to share with those who are online uh, some uh, images as well. First of all, I would like to express my sadness before showing the joy for not being present. This is an, in the church to serve the divine liturgy. This is an unprecedented uh, situation for me in, in many years. And it hurts me very deeply that one Sunday is passing by without me being in the church. But the circumstances are such that we have to uh, stay at home and take care of our health. On this great feast day, when the church has gathered, even without the shepherd, as much as they could. We see here the saying of the, of the scriptures, strike the shepherd and the sheep will run away. Unfortunately, some of us have not made it to church today, although we're healthy and well. The feast today is called the summer Pascha. What is Pascha? Easter. What does it mean? It means that it is a time when we celebrate a resurrection. In fact, a translation from this life into life eternal. The services as we had them yesterday and we have been in this morning were patterned very much after the services we do during the Holy Week. An epitaph is taken out of the, of the altar and procession and placed on the Kuvuklion, on the tomb. And uh, uh, the lamentations were chanted. We did this last night as well. The beautiful, the beautiful hymns with the melodies of Holy Friday. And today we continued with the whole story leading to the resurrection of the mother of God. The story that we just heard is an account that the church has not canonized as the scriptures, meaning that the holy tradition has transferred it to us from generation to generation, and that it contains um, some elements of the legend of what happened there. A few things are clear in the church proclaims though these things. The first one is that the Holy Virgin, the Theotokos, died. There was a time when the Roman Catholic Church, after the, the first Vatican Council, proclaimed her assumption. Assumption is a term that was used in our hymns today and is rather ambiguous and I should, we should be rather avoided. The Roman Catholics taught by dogma of, of, of the Pope, instituted by the Pope, that the Holy Virgin Mary was assumed, taken bodily into heavens in the pattern of the, the ascension of the Lord. This is not what the church has, has believed, as you see from this Proto-Evangelion, and what we believe to this day. The, East, the Orthodox Church has always believed that the Virgin Mary died she died because she's a human being, just like all of us. And because of her righteous life, because of her purity, because her body had been blessed, sanctified by God himself dwelling in her, okay, she has a special, a special role in the salvation of mankind, but also seen by God differently. Nevertheless, as a human being, she died. And what we heard in, in, the, in, the, in the gospel, the Proto-Evangelion in the reading, is the story of how this death took place. And I would like to tell, to you, tell you a few things about it. When you look at the icon that you have in front of you on the Analogion, for those unfortunate, just like me, being at home today, I will share with you the icon on your screens. If you look at the icon, we see the Virgin Mary in the center, clearly laying in the, on the deathbed. She's, she's dead. Around her, we find Apostle Peter and Paul, and at least in my representation here, one of them holding a censer, St. Peter, and around them, a few other men who are the disciples, or as some of the hymns called, the, the, uh, the hierarchs. These are the disciples, the apostles. In the center of the icon, flanked by two angels bearing lamps,
candles, we see the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As the story told us, he came down to receive the soul of his mother. I'd like you to contemplate on this for a moment here. The son, the uncreated son of, uh, the, 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 the son of God, the uncreated trinity, born of the virgin, of the woman, bearing who on earth had her blood and part of her, of her, her genes in his body, ascended by the father, has come to receive her soul. In the icon, for those who are close, you will see her wrapped in, in sw sw swaddling clothes, which is wrapped all around, nice and tight, according to how Jesus was when he was born in the cave. This is something that we remember from the times of, time of Christmas. When Jesus was born, his mother was taking care of him, she was holding him in her arms. This icon today depicts him, the son of God, holding her in his arms. It's a reversal of the roles, but still having to do with giving life. At Christmas, man gave birth to God. At the, at the ascension today, I'm sorry, the, uh, the dormition today, God gives birth to men. What kind of birth? Into the eternal kingdom. This icon is an expression of what mankind is called to achieve by God's grace and through our struggle. The Virgin Mother in the center is kind of left, right, horizontal, asleep. In, in Jesus' arm, she is upright, alive. She's alive by her son, and they have a fantastic relationship. And because of this, we turn to her to intercede on our behalf to him. Look at her. She's looking towards him, I think, in the, at least in my icon here. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what do we do about the part of the story that talks about these disciples coming up on the clouds? Okay, this is something that is uh, out of the story of the fairy tales. And, you know, we say, Father, this doesn't fly with us. Well, if you look at the icon around Jesus Christ, there's an arch. Uh, actually, double, triple arch. A Byzantine iconography element called a mandorla. The mandorla is depicted in events that um, the human eyes cannot see. The mandorla indicates that if you were there when the Virgin Mary died, you wouldn't have seen the apostles or the angels or the Lord coming. Then, how is this possible? How come the disciples have arrived and, and uh, sang hymns of praise to the Holy One and participated in her funeral, and then they were deeply saddened because of her departure? only to rejoice because she was glorified. And in her, all mankind stands the chance of being glorified eternally in the kingdom. St. Dorotheos, I'm sorry, St. Dionysius the Are Areopagite, of whom we know from the New Testament, um, from, from the book of the uh, Acts of the Apostles, St. Paul met him in Athens, is one of those who wrote in the second century, first or second century, about the event of the Dormition of the Holy Mother. He, he called on the name of another bishop, Hirothos. The two of them are present in the icons to the left and right of Jesus. Sometimes, like in the icon that I have here, next to yet another bishop, uh, Tim, uh, James, this would be uh, the Bishop of Jerusalem depicting that the whole church, Jews and Gentiles, were present there. Jerusalem for the Jews, Athens for the Gentiles. Both these writers from 
both these bishops from the early centuries were in the category of what we call the mystical experience. And, and Saint, um, I'm sorry, Hierotheos is the one that the bishop Hierotheos is the one that Dionysius is praising in the sense that his heart had been purified, illumined, and united with Christ. And in Christ, he could participate mystically in the events as described. In other words, brothers and sisters, do not expect this and do not, um, do not have an image that these people have gathered physically all together. The mandorla around Jesus and the presence of these bishops tell us differently. This is a spiritual gathering that those who have pure hearts illumined by God, who reach theosis, union with God, are given extraordinary experiences and powers of communing with one another and with Christ. We know this from experiences of contemporary saints, such as St. Paisios and St. Porfirios and so on, that we read about. There's nothing new here. And this cuts down to the very core of the Orthodox Church spirituality, which calls on us to purify our hearts, have God illumine them by his grace towards reaching union with him in full theosis. So these early accounts of the church explain how it is how it was possible for them to come together. For in the Holy Spirit, for the pure heart that is illumined, everything is possible in Christ. Therefore, brothers and sisters, the feast today is a mystical one. I was reading yesterday from the uh, uh, Holy Fathers of the Church um, from early centuries, um, such as St. Andrew of Crete, Theodore the Studite, and many more. I have a book in my hand here that's pretty thick with their homilies about this. Beautiful homilies and how they describe it in, in magnificent words, how this mystery is possible. The one who, who had in her womb the uncontainable God, the one who suffered by the cross, the sword pierced her, her heart at the cross, who did not suffer at giving birth, was the virgin before, during, and after giving birth. These are our mysteries. Continue her journey in a mystical way to fulfilling, to completing her goal, as they say, to be more glorified than any other one on earth next to her father. This one of the fathers, I think, is Saint Theodore the Studite, who makes the analogy between the sun of righteousness, like the sun up on the sky, the source of uncreated light and the moon. We all know that the moon is the largest object that we see on the, on the skies anytime beside the sun. In its beauty, the moon doesn't produce any light. The moon simply reflects the light. So with the Virgin Mary, she's not a source of light. But in her beauty, she reflects the light of God in humanity. Yeah. So for us today, as the mortals, we are gathering in two ways, to, to observe this in two ways. First of all, this is a celebration of, oh, this is a funeral leading to life and the sadness of a death is overcome by the joy of eternal life. And she was translated from life to life. And this is our calling. We know that Mary is, and first of all, some, somebody said, we know from the readings of the gospel, the gospel is not much about Mary, but Mary is about the gospel. She lived the gospel, not as an exception, as some might think, Oh, the Virgin Mary, you know, oh, she was so special. No, no, no. She's as an example of what men, you and I, are called to do. Yeah. Then, 
um, in the feast. So we have the resurrection and it's a joyful one. That's why we come to celebrate and we bring food and we break fast. Fast? Why fast? Well, you know, there's no feasting without fasting. No matter how much we look at the screen and, uh, okay. So the fast that the church has prescribed is an easy one, summertime, and it's just 14 days. But it indicates the need to cleanse our hearts a little bit so that we too could come up on the clouds to be there with the Holy Virgin Mother. This is a spiritual mystery, a spiritual exercise towards entering the mystery that we have been called to, pre to do. This fasting period was precisely meant to place us next to the bear there, next to the apostles who have gathered mystically. And to the extent that we manage to do this, we will see the Dormition of the Theotokos in a different light, the light of Christ. Finally, from the many beautiful hymns that the church has in place, um, I have selected something to tell you. This is by St. John of Damascus, who was also mentioned in this reading today. He says, at the end of the nine old canon, it's like a paraclesis, canon for the dormition of the mother of God. It's magnificent. Come, people of God, draw near to the sepulcher. That's us. Come, people of God, draw near to this sepulcher, filled with her memory. There are two things already here. We're called to come and be around the sepulcher, to be around, to be present. You know, presence takes care of most of the problems. But the sepulcher is filled with her memory. As we come to church, for 14 days, singing the Paraclesis and preparing for it, for this, for this uh, feast today, the memory of the Dormition was brought to us. And today, so powerfully in the hymns of the church and the icons that we have. Come people of God, draw near to this sepulcher filled with her memory. Show it veneration with the lips, the eyes, the heart of fidelity. Isn't this what we have been doing now for two hours? Showing veneration, not worship. For those who are new here and say, we're not worshiping the Virgin Mary. We're venerating her with lips, with eyes, and the heart of fidelity. And in sincere humility, let us now draw from this spring of God's healing. Which is the third dimension that I want to bring up to you beside the resurrection of mankind in the person of the Virgin Mary, beside our calling to be mystically present, to prepare, embrace the fast and pray and be there, to venerate, to recall her memory with lips, eyes and heart. But with humility, we approach her, draw from this spring of God's healing. The Virgin Mary is the intercessor and healer of those who suffer the joy of those who sorrow, of the ones who, whose, whose lives are being affected by the fires, as such as we know of the ones in Greece, for instance, great tragedy and devastation there. The ones in this country, the fires are raging through. The ones with COVID, such as your priest and his family. I look at the Virgin Mary here and so I can think, you know, I might be dead because of the COVID. He might be left without a priest for a while. But, the many more who are around the world in this country and, and uh, all the, the wars and everything else. There's so much need for healing. And today we also come together not only to honor her, the mother of God, greater and honor than the cherubim and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim. But we also draw near to one another, to Christ, to receive healing. And may her memory today be eternal. This is what the scripture said. Uh, this is uh, something that we uh, we also embrace and we're looking forward to our own departure when the good Lord will receive our souls in his hands, just like he did in this icon and, and this uh, of, of his very mother, 
today. The prayers of the Holy Virgin, the Theotokos, whose dormition we celebrate today. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.